Now back to the show. This is The Law Show on CL 650. There's going to be a lot of country songs around breaking exactly. up. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, we are talking about family law. We have David Halkett, partner of Macquarie Hunter and Sarah Morse Associate, talking about breaking up and divorce. And before the break, we were talking about the high cost of real estate. And, and we touched on a source of a lot of fights and breakups is money. Um, now, Sarah, we touched on the fact that you have savers and spenders. <laughs> and um, there's some hard conversations, as you mentioned, when you're telling your client, by the way, that $150,000 you have saved up in your RSP is your your low-life partner who spent and ran up all of his credit cards, you got to pay for, for his and give him half of what you saved. And that's essentially how it works under the Family Law Act now uh, because it's joint property and joint debt. So if you have a situation where you've got the spender and the saver and you end up separating then the saver has to find out that unfortunately everything they've saved, half of it is going to go to their not so saver and pay spouse. and pay half the debt. Uh, yeah, if it's their debt, then yes, they're, so they're potentially liable for that as well. How many surprises do you get? Like, how many people come into your office and have no idea that their partner has forty thousand dollars in credit card debt? They've bought a motorbike. They've bought, you know, expensive whatever. Right. It, it doesn't, fancy boys trips away to Vegas yeah. and all this kind of stuff. It, it doesn't happen that they don't know that there's some debt. Often they may not know the extent, extent of it. Right. No. Um, obviously, if they've bought like a, a Harley or something, they know that the asset's there unless the person was really good at hiding it. And, and that doesn't happen <laughs> too much. But but they might have said, I saved up for it. Yeah. And they actually just put it on the credit card. Oh, yeah. Right. And, Absolutely. And the, um, yeah, there's sometimes people really shocking how many still don't know the state of their finances when they come in. Um you know, like even though, like in my personal situation, my wife may not know exactly how much is in e- in the accounts that are mine. I don't know what's in hers. We know what each other basically has. Mm-hmm. Whereas I've had people come in and they have no idea. They don't know if their spouse has a pension. They don't. So then you have to pull out like where did the spouse work? Was it government? Was it this, etc. They don't know what the parties have. Now we had a conversation. I think the first show we did, Sarah, uh, um, that we talked about. Uh, the fact that the way we run it in our house is so old school that we have one <laughs> bank account. Yeah. You All don't the money see that. goes into one bank account, and I can look at it. My wife can look at it. So you're, most people still run, like David, you run a separate account, right, uh, from your mm-hmm. wife? Yeah, they're, they're joint for, like, in case one of us died. And it's just other ways. Yeah. But, yeah, no, she, I don't have access to her one. She doesn't have access to mine. I would say that's the majority of, of people that, that I see in my practice. Typically, what you would see is a joint account for expenses, bills, yeah. uh, for bills. So the mortgage payment, you know, kids' daycare, or things like that, groceries, um, and other, other items. And then each person has their own sort of spending account to buy their shoes or their, uh, mm-hmm. you know, their motorcycle parts or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I personally haven't had a lot of files where everything is just pooled into one account that that's not something mm-hmm. we tend to see as much of anymore people mm-hmm. are sort of uh delineating their their sort of financial freedom they're doing their own thing more and more i and, find and what is shocking sometimes is how many people have the number of credit cards they have mm-hmm. absolutely you know, like, yeah i have one myself i have one visa that i've had forever just in case our joint mastercard isn't isn't available to be used because it doesn't take it to the store or there's a problem with the machine. And my wife has a visa. We have one mask card. Everything else goes on that. You know, but there's some they have 10, 11 credit cards. It's and, the, and that's the thing is you don't know that someone's applied and received a new credit card. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we joint, yeah. yeah. We see that a lot where, where couples have, uh, when we have someone come in to meet with us and they don't even know how many bank accounts the other person has. And, and it may yeah. be five or six and then TFSAs and, and other accounts. So, And then the shocking thing is sometimes when <clears throat> there's someone they say, well, he hasn't listed all the accounts he has, but then the person doesn't have them. But then because you don't know exactly what they have, you think the person has more than what they really have. So what is the disclosure that needs to take place? And 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 do people try to circumvent the rules? I, I don't, I mean, they, they could, I suppose, but as part of our disclosure process, so if you're, if you're filing an action and starting a claim in Supreme Court, you have to do a financial statement. So, um, and if both parties have a lawyer, you're exchanging financial statements and, and in there you have to disclose everything. It's a sworn financial document. So you do have to list out 
all of your assets. So that includes your TFSAs, any bank accounts, stocks, any kind of investments, even collections of valuable items. And then you have to list all of your debts as well. So each party to uh, a family law case has to do that. So there's, and, there's and not really any way around it. to hide it? Oh, there's always people that, that do. They, they try to put off completing it you know, waiting until debts get a certain level before they fill it out. And, and there's there's always little tactics involved that some people use, but you can't get away from it. The court will order it, and if, the, and if you still don't obey it, then the court can just say, well, I'm assuming that because you didn't complete it, that the reason you didn't complete it is because it wouldn't help you if you did, so therefore what, I, what they're saying you have, <laughs> you have. Now, what about the, we've talked about this in the past, the guy's, say he's in a trade, he does a lot of money, done a lot of work on the side for cash, and he's, or maybe he sells drugs or something, and, and he's got lots of money, doesn't go in the bank, doesn't, isn't a way to track it, and what happens then? You, you can ask the court to impute income. Uh, when I was doing the contract with the government, that, I mean, the majority of people we dealt with were tattoo artists, truck drivers, taxi cab drivers, all sorts of professions where there was money coming in that wasn't necessarily recorded. So we can ask the court to impute income based on what an, a, a typical person in that job would make. And failing all else, you can impute minimum wage quite easily because if you're you know, a 40-year-old man with no injuries, no reason why you can't work, it's pretty easy to say, well, you should be working and earning at least minimum wage at uh, you know, 21. Or, but somebody sorry. would rather say, yeah, oh, yeah, I make yeah. minimum wage instead of the... Then you can also look, though, at, at You look lifestyle. historically, yeah. Like if, if someone... I had a, a guy years ago drive in and said he made 15000 and I think I mentioned the story before. He had a brand new H3, Hummer. which alone yeah. was the payments were 800 a month. So there's no way. Um, a lot of people, they bury their expenses in the business. So the business will pay for car payments, car. pay for all that stuff. That can be imputed back to them. You know, you say, look, there's no way you use the car 100% for business. It's rare. You know, sometimes it does, but sometimes usually it doesn't. Um, you can look at how many trips they take. What was the lifestyle like when they were together? Do you have season hockey tickets? And exactly. Stuff like that, right. Exactly. So you can look at it. It's a similar uh, kind of thing that CRA will do to someone who says they never made any money, yet they have. You know, like when we saw that story of the, the, the student who had a two and a half million dollar mm-hmm. house, it's like, how is that possible unless you have sources of income somehow? Okay. So when they come to your office, what kind of things, how, how wide a net are you casting? All of their financial statements, including um, things that you might not think of. Pensions is one. Pensions is a, a big one because often people will forget if there's been multiple jobs and there's multiple pensions, for example, and, and people don't necessarily understand employment pensions. So pensions are a big one. Um, you know, valuable collections. I mean, yeah. I've had people that, that have um, valuable antiques um, and vehicles, um, you know, classic mm-hmm. cars, things like that. And then it's your run of the mill, your your TFSAs and your RSPs and, and all of those um, financial investments. Those are, those are all And you assets. may have a rec property that you... You yeah, know, own up, up country condo in Whistler or something. Exactly, yeah. and sometimes there's timeshares. They're harder to deal with because they're really hard to sell. But <laughs> still, <laughs> that's what you should say to the guy in Mexico yeah. who tries to sell you one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so you know, there's those that sometimes say some people have property in the U.S. that even though we our courts can't deal with it necessarily, it's a factor when it comes to negotiating a settlement. You know, you keep that, I'll keep this, and there's all kinds of things that way. So all the bank statements, the property, everything. Now, what is excluded? So what what can you take from the marriage um, that you don't have to divide? Well, and it's not necessarily as simple as yeah, not being able to... Not as used to be. Yeah, yeah not, a, not as easy as it used to be. But um, typically, if you have brought something into the marriage, so if you owned a property prior to the time that you started living together, then that's an excluded asset. But what can still be divided is the increase in value of that asset. So if you, if you sold a condo for $100,000 and you got married and then you bought a new condo for 200000 that went up to 600000 you're supposed to pay the on, difference, yeah, right? On the face of it, you should um, get the 100000 yeah. back. Back. Yeah. But in May of this year, our Court of Appeal, and it went up to the Supreme Court of Canada, and I think the appeal application of appeal was dismissed. I think so. um, if that was put into joint names... You may have lost your exclusion because it, they presume a gift between spouses. So in that case, you may have lost the $100,000 exclusion. 
that was intended even to be though, traced through. Even though putting it in joint names is what you do when you're married. Exactly, because mm-hmm. they're saying, because, and that's what the court says, well, you're married, so therefore it's assumed it's going to be uh, a, a, a gift. Um, the There's talk of changing the legislation to make it such that maybe you lose half the exclusion, you keep half of it. it we don't know how that'll all play out. But right now, the, the key, that's why we're doing a lot of cohabs or, or marriage agreements mm-hmm. insofar as, you can say uh, this hundred thousand. Even if you put the house in joint names, this hundred thousand remains mine. mine. Oh, so you you take care of that and have it written down exactly. at the time. Yeah, but, you, you do that in a marriage agreement or cohab yeah, right. agreement. But what's happened is people, of course, come to see Sarah and me when they've broken up, and this After has happened yeah. years earlier. Okay, now what about because we're seeing this a lot? Uh, mom and dad of one family has some money, mm-hmm. and they say, "Okay, we're going to give uh, you know, Johnny's mom and dad fifty thousand dollars towards a down payment on a." their first condo and they go in there and they and they buy the condo and you know they bought it for three hundred thousand dollars it's worth four fifty now mm-hmm. and they break up right so who gets that fifty thousand does johnny get it is it supposed to go back to mom and dad or is it just split v- very fact driven um mm-hmm. the if the gift says specifically to the son him or herself and it was kept in her own name then this exclusion applies because it was a gift from someone a third party um if it was a loan then you better make sure you have um, loan documents or a promissory note of some kind uh, because it's usually a gift until you broke up. Then it became a loan. Right. <laughs> um, the the other spouse who didn't get it, the the, the son-in-law or daughter-in-law, often says, well, it was a gift to both of us because mm-hmm. we, we're a married we got couple, married. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, you want to make sure the gift is very specific as to who it, who it is, who it was for, uh, and then the marriage agreement could come in saying that I got this gift from – my, my parents. Are people waking up to this now? I, I think so. Um, usually, no one goes into getting married thinking this is going to end. So no one thinks that to do this. But I think with the value of property... It's large sums of money are, is floating around. Exactly. Yeah. It's and not, I guess parents are... Parents are definitely... Because yeah. uh, yeah, the parents yeah. have got, of, uh, of a generation that have seen the divorces and how yeah. they've ended badly. And they said, okay, we're going to give you a head start for your first condo or whatever... But knowing that this is... It could end. Yeah. It could end. So we want protection that they want to get their money back mm-hmm. to protect their child, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would say we're seeing more of that, uh, yeah. more uh, more documentation that mm-hmm. this was just to my daughter, for example, to, to purchase property. And, and even sometimes parents who have acquired a lot of wealth themselves are requiring their children to do a prenup to, in effect, mm-hmm. protect the parents' assets. Sure. Um, even though, really, at the end of the day, if, if the, the parents can't, person can't really protect the parent's asset. They say, if you get this, it's yours. But if they get a will, it's will to them, they may not be able to, they can say, look, I'm going to give it to my wife. You can't stop me. But a lot of parents are doing that because they're worried about their wealth going to the other. Especially if they don't like the wife or husband, right? (laughs) Yeah. And and they all you get that again. They all love them until they break up. Then it's like I knew you shouldn't marry that person. Yeah. (laughs) Well, the the worry is, and you, you, someone tells you I've broken up, and then they say, "Oh, I never liked her. I never liked him." Then they get back together, and then at the next party, you're like, uh, "Yeah, how do you like me now?" (laughs) Exactly. It's never easy. Never easy. (laughs) All right, we're going to continue our conversation. We'll get into some specifics of different kinds of uh, real estate and and things. Uh, We're talking about family law. Sarah Morse is here from uh, uh, McCrory Hunter and David Halkett. We'll continue our conversation next on The Family Law Show. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CR 650.